me put my, sorry, sorry. Let me. Yes, okay. <laughs> my cat has issues. Um, okay, let's welcome Simon and he will explain putting it all together or pulling it all apart. Thanks. Um, if uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, run through a, a sort of intro to me, what we do, what I've done, and um, I know there are a lot of school owners here, and this is kind of going to be a bit of an open Q&A discussion, but hopefully a structured one. So if you could put questions into the chat, please, and stay on mute, and either Linda or I will call upon you um, to, to talk. That would, um, that would be very helpful. Um, okay, so I shall get started. Can everybody see that okay? Yes, I think so. Okay, so uh, as Linda mentioned, I'm Simon Moran from Modern English. Uh, I know quite a lot of the people who are here and you're probably all bored with hearing me um, wibbling on, but you're gonna have to um, listen to it all again. So at the, at the moment, as things stand, we have 10 schools in Japan. Uh, we publish uh, a preschool product called uh, Happy Valley. Uh, we, our schools we run, uh, I own one of the schools and we run franchises and affiliates uh, for whom we provide uh, services to allow um, people to run their own schools. And I was delighted to hear Masaki talking about systems because I think people here know that I'm a big fan of systems and I wanna talk a bit about that today and sort of explain how that's allowed us to do what we want to do and um, hopefully um, give uh, you all some insights into taking on ideas that you have uh, that you would like to expand upon. And uh, I guess, could we have a, a show of hands somehow or a, a message into chat? How many of the people here own their own school? There's quite a few. I think there are there maybe some more do as well. Okay. So I think, um, yeah, lots of school owners. I think a really important question, uh, this is us and this is where our schools are. There used to be more dots on that, used to be more dots on that map, but uh, we had 14 schools at one point. Uh, we're down to 12 and then we're down to 10. Lots of different reasons for that, which you can ask me questions about later on. But I think uh, a very important um, question that possibly we should have asked ourselves before we opened our schools, but we should uh, continually re-ask is what do we want to do? And why are we doing it? You know, what do we do and who is it for? And, you know, do you wish to be a teacher? Uh, do you wish to be a business owner, a manager, uh, an administrator, a marketer? Um, because they're all functions of a school, very necessary functions of a school. And just because you're a great teacher, and let's just assume that everybody here is a great teacher, doesn't mean you're a good manager and doesn't mean you're a good marketer or an administrator. And you may not want to do any of those things. Um, so that's worthy of consideration. <clears throat> so back in um, 1998, I was working as a teacher in a, in a small school above a flower shop in Korean, Hirakata, just a few um, hundred meters away from, from uh, where I'm sitting now. And I wasn't very happy. And so I thought I could do it better myself and wanted to do it myself. So I started, and this is Modern English School number one in my old apartment, as you can see, uh, there's a desk, a kotatsu, which I was using as my desk. My file is open. I'm doing some planning. It looks like lesson planning. I haven't tidied up the room. You can see the sofa is a bit of a mess. So please don't follow my lead on not tidying up your classroom before you take the photo of your first um, ever school. But the thing that happened for me was when I started doing this, it all meant so much more. Um, I was in control of everything as much as you can be and my work rate increased, my job satisfaction increased, my, uh, the quality of my work increased hugely 
uh, now that I was doing it um, for, for myself. So I loved the freedom and the independence. I was single. Um, I spoke at the time what was seen, what was basically enough Japanese to answer the adverts that I put into the local free paper. And I built it up from there. Um, incidentally, if you, look, if you look closely, you will probably see a copy of David Paul's Communicate by the left hand leg of the table. That was one of the texts that I was using at the time. And this is, uh, this is actually the next door to the room that I'm in at the moment. This is what one of our adult classrooms looked like now, looks like now. This is just before we opened the new premises on the third floor. And that's going back quite some time as well. And it's a lot nicer. I think everybody will agree. And uh, this is what a typical adults class used to look like. And used to look like is probably the important um, the important point. But back here in Modern English School number one, I used to do everything myself. I, I wrote the ads, I had help with the Japanese, obviously I made the flyers uh, in Word, printed them out in black and white and handed them out locally. I did all the scheduling, I answered the phones in Japanese, as I said. I, frankly, I don't know how I had the nerve, the confidence or the ignorance perhaps to speak in Japanese to prospective customers. Um, but I managed it. Um, but I very quickly realized as, as we uh, grew, and we grew really quite quickly then. So I started, this was 1998. <clears throat> we moved down in, into um, the, a room by the station a couple of years later, and I started taking on teachers, and we grew very quickly. And I realized that I needed to take on staff to do work that I couldn't do, and crucially work that I didn't want to do. Uh, because I was making some decisions about what I wanted to do. Um, and so that's how we ended up doing what we do now. A large part of our business is providing those services to people who are solo teacher owner operators. So we do the back office work, we answer the telephones for them, we write the copy, uh, we uh, put the uh, marketing campaigns together, uh, design the flyers, we run the Google Ads campaigns for them, we supply the curriculum and the training, we do all the scheduling. Uh, and so this allows a solo teacher just to concentrate on teaching plus local marketing, which only, uh, only can be done locally. And this is something that Masaki was saying in his um, presentation earlier on. And so um, the school functions, the, the issues that face school owners really are getting students and keeping students. And amongst all of that, there's all of these things, marketing, sales, pricing, curriculum, admin, um, staff, you can read all of this. And so first off, um, I would like to follow on from what Masaki was saying. Um, I've only got the one word marketing written on here, but it's a much, much bigger story than that. And we have to look at branding, marketing, and advertising. But without what Maske referred to as the vision of who you are and what you want to do, you cannot do any of that. So I would like now you to put into chat what you think the difference between branding and marketing is. Oops. <laughs> and for some reason, I can't see the chat. So Linda, if you could read out any answers that come into the chat to me, that would be great. Brand is the look and marketing is the message. Branding is an asset you can sell. Branding is a logo. Marketing is how you sell yourself. Marketing is how we gather students, add values when you sell. I think it's possibly helpful to think of branding, uh, something that allows you to have a relationship and a feeling about a brand that is run by an organization. So for example, 
could you put some answers into chat here about what you think the Apple Hotel would be like? Imagine an Apple Hotel. <laughs> this is Apple, the company that makes cool breakdown after two years, super high tech, minimalist, like all their other products, filled with Apple products. Okay. Minimalist, like all their other products, super cool, overpriced. Okay. This is how people feel about Apple. Uh, what do you think the Hilton iPhone would be like? Luxurious, but overpriced. I'm not sure the last time Eddie stayed in a Hilton hotel. Um, Hilton are not really well known for being super luxurious. They're not the Four Seasons or the Imperial or the Park Hotel. <laughs> um, I think this illustrates that. I think it's, it's really quite um, easy to imagine an Apple hotel. You can, you can imagine walking into the, four, uh, into the um, uh, uh, reception area and seeing the Apple logos and possibly some products and it being minimalist. Um, I'm not so sure that anybody uh, could um, imagine a Hilton phone because Hilton isn't really a brand in that sense. Apple has uh, transcended making computers into being a brand that does many, many other things. And as has been seen on lots and lots of fora, um, people are passionate about Apple and they love Apple. Some people hate it, but lots of people love it. Enough people love it to make it the richest company that's ever existed in the history of the world. And somebody's suggesting they might make a car. They make watches, they make phones, they supply music, they supply email, uh, they supply cloud storage. They do a lot more than just make computers. Hilton only run hotels and they don't have a particularly good reputation. They're not the best hotel around. They're a you know, medium priced, close to the station, decent enough hotel. And I think that's the difference. That's what a brand is. It's the relationship that you have with that brand. Marketing, however, is telling that story to people, is getting that story out to say, it just works or any other slogan that you want to use or, or, or placement of that image anywhere. It reminds you of the brand and it tells you a story about that brand. And that's what marketing is. So we've got branding, marketing, and then advertising, which is completely different to marketing, completely different to marketing. They're often used interchangeably, but they're not. Advertising is the offer of goods and services at a specific price, often with um, a uh, call to action, 20% off before the end of March uh, or, or some such. So advertising is, is the offer of a specific product at certain conditions for a certain price. Okay, I want to get onto systems at some point, I suspect we are probably not going to get through all of the things that are on here. Um, so is there anything in particular from those other blue buttons on there that people would like to discuss? How to keep pricing. I'm very pleased that Masaki talked about pricing here. Um, and, he, and he did say, look at the local competition. Um, and of course, you have to do that. But you should do that and then not do make the classic mistake, which is to charge less than the local competition. The last thing that anybody should do is get involved in a race to the bottom through lower pricing. 
the worst thing that can happen uh, in a race to the bottom is that you win it. The second worst thing that could happen in a race to the bottom is that you come second. A race to the bottom in pricing is no good for anybody. So do not do that. Yes, you have to be aware of what's available, but you have to differentiate. And um, you can differentiate on price, but you can charge higher prices if you dif if you differentiate. Um, incidentally, again, if if people uh, some of some of us are in Tokyo, some of you are in Tokyo, and others are elsewhere. If you could pop into the chat, your average the average cost of uh, say a monthly fees for elementary kids who are coming once a week, so four times a month including tax, and you should be advertising your prices, including tax by law from April the 1st. Could you pop into chat how much you charge for your elementary kids to come once a week? So we've got eight, eight, ten, eleven, five, five, oh, interesting number. Ten thousand, twelve thousand. A wide variety. Some people are fifty percent more than others. Why is that? What went into the thoughts behind that pricing? Three thousand yen for a fifty minute lesson. All right. I presume, yeah, right. Through. That's 12,000 yen a month. Um, then I guess the, 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 the next um, metric on that one is how many children would there be in that class? So David Juto wins this because he can make 120,000 yen revenue a month from one of his classes. That's very nice numbers. Uh, Corgi English six max uh, 11 is half of the potential revenue that David Juto is bringing in for the same work, assuming that you have 100% capacity. Eddie was eight via so 80,000, so two thirds of David Judo. David Judo, step forward, you are winning. Um, <laughs> I think that's just an illustration in that, you know, there's no such thing as a standard price for essentially the same product, which is, I'm guessing, for a large part of people, general English, that I'm sure there is some academic English in there as well. Um, but essentially we can range from, I think somebody was down at 6,000 yen for six or 8,000. Did somebody say 6,000? 8,800 is the lowest. Um, I'm not sure how many that was for, but essentially from somewhere around about 40 or 50,000 yen a month to 120,000 yen a month for the same work. And I know that David is in Tokyo, but some of the people in here are in uh, Saitama stuff as well. So there's not that much of an economic difference. It's not that much in the, in the spare cash that the parents have to spend. So, uh, David, what did you base your pricing on? You, oh, you, you want me to speak to that? That would be great, yeah. Um, I based my pricing on two things. One is to, uh, number one, I didn't have that capacity when I started, I didn't have the capacity to have 12 students in a class. Originally it was like eight or 10, but I base that pricing on don't uh, begin with the end in mind. Don't charge a price so low that you'll regret it later on because it's difficult to raise a price. So that was one thing. I didn't want to be too high and I certainly didn't want to be too low, like you said. So I just thought we just like, I don't know, my wife and, you know, part of it was what people were paying, but not really. It was just a price that we felt that we could live with five, 10 years later. And did you start off with a maximum of 12 students in one class? When no, you... that was, that, that, that came in the last four years, but it was eight to 10 up until. 
But if you went from eight to 12, say for example, right, you've increased your income potential by 50% by moving from eight in a class to 12 in a class whilst keeping the same price point. And I'm guessing not that not leading to customer dissatisfaction. Not at all. There's never been a question about that at all. Right. Excellent. Thank you for that, David. That's brilliant. That fantastically illustrates that if you have confidence in what you deliver as your product or your service and people understand that, people will pay for it. 10,000 yen a month to a lot of families is not a lot of money. Uh, managing a school of, uh, sorry, managing a classroom of 12 elementary school kids may be something that a lot of people are not comfortable with. Um, but it just shows that it can be done. So the first, the first thing to be learned from that is obviously take into account your location. Dave is in Machida, which is not a poor part of the world, but uh, increase your class sizes and increase your prices is the most obvious way to increase your revenue. As Masaki pointed out, it, estimates are range in different industries, but five times as much money to recruit a new student as it is to keep an existing student. And I think that's what somebody had popped up on there is like something to uh, talk about is keep students. Masaki talked about this in his presentation as well, customer satisfaction, staff satisfaction. If you have staff, uh, a product that they know that they like and they know that it works and a good feeling about the brand. It all goes back to having a good feeling about the brand. Masaki was very clear in the types of questions that he um, asked the parents of the kids at my gym. So these are under age six. Are you satisfied? That's it. That's the question. They know that you're an English school. They've joined you because you're an English school. Presumably they've done um, a free trial lesson. They have probably looked at other schools in the area. You might think that your students come to you for a reason that they don't come to you. It might be because you're near or it might be because they've heard you're good. I suspect nobody's going to David's school because it's cheap and that's where you want to be. You do not want to be the cheap school because it will not work long term. Somebody will always go lower than you. Um, something else that came up was keeping students past grade six elementary. You have to adapt. I think as foreigners running a Kiowa schools, and I would suggest the first thing to do is ditch a Kiowa from the name of your school and call yourself an English school because that's what you are, a four skills or five skills English school. Um, uh, the fifth skill being output uh, as interaction and presentation, which is on the Moncashio syllabus. But English for children, um, is, is just English, but for, for uh, a lot of people, there is uh, general English, so fluency. There is school English, and there is, a, uh, there is English for tests, essentially Aiken. That's initially what this presentation was gonna be about. Um, and I think that schools that don't adapt very, very quickly to showing that what they do, showing to parents what they do, improves fluency for interaction and for output. And obviously have a graded reading program, go back in and get the uh, video for Leslie Ito's presentation on the Lixon library system to help you put in a reading library. Um, but also kids are, will be facing either entrance tests and certainly grammar at school. Uh, you can illustrate this, uh, Charlie Brown was talking uh, in his presentation about the need for teaching words like with and for. In the grade five syllabus in Hirakata here, one of the pieces of language is what do you want for your birthday? So they're doing the right thing in teaching a high frequency word for, uh, but that is not found in most general English curriculum textbooks, such as Let's Go or uh, many, many of the others out there but it's specifically in the uh, elementary school syllabus. And then if you look at Aiken, Aiken will say things like, I want to go camping, I want to go swimming, and it teaches go camping, go swimming, etc., as a piece of language to be learned. So schools have to be providing all of this English. And if you don't, you will wither and die. We just got our Aiken results in the other week, and we've got first and second graders who've passed Aiken grade five 
the first time. They do a general English course and they have a supplementary course with a Japanese teacher. We use off the shelf textbooks, Debu Jun Pastan and Hitotsu uh, Hitotsu, one by Ogunsha, one by Gakken, uh, very, very well known textbooks. And the Japanese teacher goes through the grammar that we do in the general English course and adds to it with learning the vocabulary for Aiken and learning the points for Aiken and the kids pass. And a seven-year-old passing Aiken grade five is an incredibly motivating thing for him to do. He loves to come here and study. He loves having the two lessons. He's bragging about it. And this is something that I, the, um, the, the idea of having the thousand true fans, the people that love your brand and your product will talk about it and they will generate word of mouth. And word of mouth is the best form of marketing worldwide for all products bar none. So have a good product, cover everything. You have to adapt to what is changing in the market. And there's, a, there's an increasing focus on, on Aiken with the changes to the English syllabus. The, the level of English that was being taught in junior high school is coming down into elementary school. Elementary schools are beginning to do very well what a Kyo school has been doing for a long time. If you can't provide more than just what a Kyo's have been resting on the laurels a bit with, I think being the foreigners, the purveyors of native English, which is also a shift away from it will, uh, schools can face a very, very difficult future. So embrace general English, academic English and test prep. Do it well, charge well, Ask your, ask your parents if they're satisfied, and that should generate word of mouth. If you're cheap now, how can you raise your prices? Put them up. That's it. <laughs> you could be nice to your existing students and grandfather them in, uh, but your new students won't know that your prices have gone up. They might have heard it, but they, they cannot have any feelings of regret if they join at a newer, higher price. You could give grandfathering or giving a stay of execution to your existing customers to um, soften the blow. They will have forgotten about it by the time the price goes up. And we've done that several times, uh, a couple few years ago, where we essentially raised our, uh, our prices by about 24%. Didn't lose a single student knowingly because of it. Um, if people like you and what you do and they, they value your product, they will stay. Okay. So keeping students by, by reaching into what the Juku do, keep your students that way, provide um, Juku and English Eikawa at the same time. Anybody else want to raise prices for existing or new students? Raise prices for everybody immediately but delay the effect of that. So put your prices up, new students pay the new price and give your um, existing students either a six month um, grace period. Right. How many people here have an operations manual? Early on, I, I said that Christine has got on great. <clears throat> Early on, I said that we need, really need to give th thought to what we want to do. It may be that you may be running. Um, uh, <laughs> people are answering that, that their spouse is their operations manual. That's great if you both want to continue doing that. If you don't want to continue doing that, you need to change it and stay or change it and leave. Uh, changing it and leaving could mean closing down or selling it. Um, you can't sell your wife, I don't think. Um, so the advantage of an operations manual is that you can replace people with systems. And lots of people like to think they're irreplaceable, but they aren't. And I, I wanna ask a specific question to the North Americans in the audience and a different one to the British people or the Europeans in the audience, if there are any. Um, I think we've all heard of Harvard. 
if the Europeans could type in to chat the name of the best teacher currently at Harvard. And if the North Americans could type in to the chat the name of the best teacher currently teaching at Oxford University. <laughs> Nobody knows anybody who is teaching at Oxford or Harvard, it would appear. And therefore, those teachers at Oxford and Harvard are replaceable and interchangeable. The institution remains, its reputation and its brand remains, but the institution is not the people that are in it. And any, not anybody could do that job, of course, but the people that are teaching at the moment now will not be teaching there forever but those institutions will continue. This is what you have to strive to achieve at your school if you wish to sell or if you wish to move out of the jobs that you're currently doing. Um, I doubt very much that the best teacher at Harvard's wife or husband is the operations manual there. So to form um, an operations manual, it's a good idea to do two things. You should do um, uh, organization chart and even if there's just two of you, if it just is you and your spouse, write down all the different jobs that you do and put them into different areas. Some of it is teaching, some of it is admin, some of it is marketing, some of it is sales. Write down all of those tasks. Form an organization chart with the head of that uh, department, which is essentially what it is, as an organization chart is concerned, and then write a list of instructions of how to do those jobs. And that is the beginning of an organization chart and an operations manual. And that will allow you to um, move out of the jobs that you don't want to do and give them to somebody else to do. You could outsource them or you could uh, hire somebody in. It will also allow you to expand. And this is what we did with the first school that went from that very scruffy room um, in, in Hirakata, actually in Negar, um, and expanded it into 14 schools at, at one time. We wrote down every single thing that we do we formed operation, we wrote operations manuals and we can train people how to do that. We can replicate what we do in any location, anywhere in Japan. And we have done that. So if you want to stay doing everything that you're doing, just continue. If you want to teach fewer classes per week, you need instructions for somebody to replace you. If you want to give up doing all of the classes, you need to replace all of the classes. You need to hire quality teachers. Just because the teachers at Harvard are replaceable doesn't mean they're not high quality. They absolutely are high quality. So Harvard recruits high quality teachers that fit in with its brand. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. So um, that's why an operations manual will help you uh, either stop doing, <laughs> stop doing work that you don't want to do uh or replicate what you're doing in another location or crucially sell it lots of people want to sell their school at some point and i see this all the time schools come up on the market all the time I, we've bought a few schools but i've turned down so many schools because essentially it's dependent upon the owners and the risk for the buyer is that once the owner who's the teacher leaves all of the students will leave with them um, and so you may not have the asset that you think you have. Uh, you should also be doing a budget. This is really, really important. How much are you actually earning? And it's important to realize that your net profit is not what's left at the end of the month because unless you're accounting for your salary on the budget or what it would cost uh, to replace somebody to do the work that you're doing. Um, I did a talk on budgets, which is on uh, my uh, YouTube channel somewhere. And so you can go and have a look at that. And uh, you can get in touch if, if you would like some help doing, doing a budget. Uh, but the, these are the crucial things I think that you need is an organization chart, systems and operations manual, and to do a budget. Um, okay, so um, from, from those uh, blue points on there, anything else that people would like me to address? Staff don't have any. That's my advice. That's why I did franchises, because I don't want to look after staff. There's two reasons why I did franchises. I wanted to replicate the um, <clears throat> feeling in 
teacher owners that I had when I became self-employed. Uh, like I said earlier on, everything just meant so much more all of a sudden. And I think that, you know, ownership is very, very powerful. I'd also had a, uh, um, a experience running a branch with a partner. Uh, it was very difficult. It was difficult to have a partner, so I wouldn't do that again either. And uh, running staff is very, very difficult. I do employ staff here at my head school, and it's the most difficult thing that we do. Um, or our, our staff are great, um, but it's still the most difficult thing that we do. So avoid staff. Outsource as much as you can. Once you've got an operations manual and you know what you're doing, you can outsource things. We use Crowdworks and uh, Odesk, various outsourcing. Uh, I run an outsourcing company. We provide services to um, uh, other schools. So people ring our call center and we do um, the uh, sales, marketing, scheduling, fee collection for them. So people outsource those services to us and we do those. Um, I'm going to flick forward a little bit to some uh, slides that I've got. I've, I've used these before. Can everybody see that? Quickly, just somebody raise their hand if they can see that. All right, great. So CRR, customer retention rate, uh, CL, customer lifetime, CLV, customer lifetime value. Now these numbers are old, but these numbers came from essentially, I think at the time about 17 years worth of data um, that we've recorded at our schools. And it shows that, as Maskey was talking about this before, that the massive, massive uh, proportion of the value of the market in adult students. So customer retention rate, amongst adults was at this point, so about two years ago, was about 92%. For kids, it was 70%. The customer lifetime for adults was five years and 11 months, as opposed to two years and nine months for kids, which uh, is, I think, slightly higher now. And I've always been very disappointed with that, but that's the kids leaving to go to Chuku, basically. And the CLV, the customer lifetime value. So from uh, our pricing used to be quite low. We can expect 770,000 yen from an adult on average and uh, 300,000 yen from a kid as a student. Our prices are actually quite low. Um, but this is our leaderboard in terms of cost, uh, lifetime and lifetime value. So again, th this is two years old and these students are still with us, all three of them. So that would now be 16 years, 15 years and 12 years. And somebody staying with us for uh, 13 years and it, uh, earning us more money than somebody stayed for 16 years was because they're on a different course. They're on a free course, uh, which they pay more for and they have more options. But that's the value of keeping a customer 2.5 million yen worth of value. Uh, this again is two years old, this data and something very interesting in here. I was talking about flyers earlier on. We're not doing we're not handing out any flyers at all in COVID times. But you could see, again, this is 16 or 17 years worth of data, which is now two years old, but 24.8% um, of our new business was coming from flyers, 23% from intros, word of mouth. Pado is a magazine we don't use anymore. Web is there at 14.18%. This is last year's numbers and web referrals are 60% of our new business. And the cost per acquisition estimate for a web referral, we have a web marketing budget of 850 yen a day. We use a company that does retargeting uh, Google ads for us and it's really quite uh, tricky. Um, the cost of acquisition is 13,489 yen for each new student that joins us via our web. Um, uh, the, the flyers are at 45,000 yen. But if you put that against the customer lifetime value, we have a 63,000% return on investment on our web marketing, as opposed to an 825% return on our flyer marketing. Uh, eye to eye is on there as a paid referral scheme, and that has a uh, return on investment of 3,607%. To do good web marketing, you've got to be able to do this. You can see that modern English in terms of impression, insight report, recognition is higher than Shane because we've got a good web guy. It's really important to understand that more money now is spent on web ads by very big companies than is spent on TV ads. And actually you cannot compete against them because they will outbid you every single time. Google click-through ads is an auction you buy you bid on a click and you set your maximum that you're prepared to pay 
and big companies like Shane and Gabba will pay more than you every single time. So you really need to know what you're doing or hire somebody that knows what they're doing so that you can spend effectively. So you can click on, you can uh, display the ads at the right time to the right people. And this is how it looks. This is an, a non-targeted ad. So if you look at the number of impressions and the number of clicks and then the money spent for that versus the targeted one. So that's 4,300 impressions against 12,000 with 11 clicks versus 37 clicks for 2,837 yen spent as opposed to 1,025 yen spent there. So in these flyery COVID -y times, I would suggest that you do both brand marketing and advertising um, via Google ads, but you get somebody who knows what they're doing to do it for you and you, sp you be prepared to spend five to 800 yen per day, every day. It's not a lot of money. You don't need to do anything other than prepare banner ads uh, and you can outsource that. And I would suggest that you go to a company called Crowdworks where you can get a designer where you pay by the hour or piece of work. And there are some great designers on there. Uh, you need a Japanese copywriter because you probably can't write good Japanese copy. Most of you probably can't write good English copy because it's a specialist job. Uh, like teaching English. And I think the, the thought often by um, small business owners of all types and particularly uh, school owners is that you can do everything yourself. And I think that is a big, big mistake. And it leads us back to the organization chart and the systems and then hiring and buying excellence. And I'm gonna stop my share. And I think if we can just open it up to questions in the remaining few minutes. And please feel free to turn your mic on and ask a question. Everybody's gone shy. Mm, thinking. Uh, question. You mentioned at the beginning that you went from 14 schools to 12 schools to 10. Can you describe what was happening for that to be happening? We actually went from 14 to 10 to 12, back down to 10. Okay, sorry, yeah. And uh, again, Masaki brought this up in, in, his, uh, in his presentation. And what happened was I turned 40, I moved house, and I opened three schools all in the same month in April 2007. In September or October of that year, Nova went bust. There was the layman shock and there was a massive drop in the market. And we went from a position where we used to open a school and it would be successful to having our first failures. And it was a massive shock. There was a drop in the market anyway, which we hadn't seen coming. We should have probably seen coming. Uh, but the Nova collapse had a massive, massive impact on, on the whole industry. September 2007, the only month that we've never recruited any new students in our entire 23 years of trade. And then the layman shock, and it was in America, but it had a massive, massive effect on people's spending. People get, when bad things happen, people get cautious and they don't spend new money. So that was basically what happened. Um, of the three schools that we opened uh, in, that, in April 2007, one of them still exists and he did very, very well. He spotted what he wanted to do in his market. He only teaches adults. He's in a place called Uehomachi in Osaka and he targeted uh, pretty wealthy adults. He's got a lot of private students and he's doing very, very well. Another one that opened in Motomachi in Kobe failed within a year. Mm. Uh, so that's what happens. So we went down to 10. It was, it was horrible. It, it felt really, really bad. You know, it was, I had failed in schools. Uh, mm -hmm. But you just have to be realistic. It's, you know, they, they were franchises. And the, the only thing that's different between our franchises is the owner and the location. By definition, everything else is the same. Mm. So it's the teacher and they're implementing it or not. And they like them or not. But the location and the timing uh, is crucial. So we learned a lot. We learned a lot through all of that. Hmm. Has the recent financial crisis because of COVID-19 had any effect on? I think more than that. So we have, we, we are still basically a general English school. We don't do after school. We don't do Saturday school and we don't do uh, immersion kindergarten. So we don't, we're not in those markets. So the, the product and the services that we supply, there's been a drop in that of between 40 and 60% are the estimates. Um, 
And um, so we've suffered from that more than we suffered from uh, this recent year. In fact, at head school last year, Corian, um, we recruited more students in 2020 than we did in 2019. So it's not all bad out there. Mm -hmm. I think initially it was, people were terrified. Publishing was down horribly. People, you know, COVID hit like February, March. People buy textbooks in April. Publishing was down 40% last year. It was horrible, brutal. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think, you know, I think people have got used to it. I've got, got used to the idea that, you know, you can still, as long as you're cautious, you can still get around mm -hmm. and go to schools. Uh, any advice for Inaka specific advice? One of the great things that uh, being in, in the countryside is you, you just need to be the best available option. So just be good and people will come to you because you've probably got less competition. So be the best local school, be the school that everybody comes to. Uh, staff recruitment. I don't outsource uh, recruitment of teaching staff. I advertise the jobs in Japan and I get good candidates and there we interview and train those ourselves. I outsource design work, uh, printing work, flyer work, uh, web development work, uh, artwork, some music, things like that. Uh, external training. Yes, I would. Um, I think it's a very good idea to send uh, your staff particularly uh, onboarding uh, less experienced people to uh, training centers. I think that's a very good idea or bring trainers in. I am happy to keep going if people would like to stay. So please just fire away with questions. Or if I've bored you all <laughs> into submission, feel free to leave. It's always interesting. Thank you very much. Best way to start online ads. I mean, have a go yourself. Just open up a, a Google ads account and have a go yourself. Spend some money, see what you get. Make sure you track it. Uh, make sure your pixel's firing. Um, and uh, see what see what returns you get. I think the thing with web ads is that, um, so obviously you've got to track all your referrals, make sure you write down how people know about you. But the thing about web ads is you may not get a direct hit off it that day. Somebody may see that web ad it fires and you get a click and they go to your website, but they may come back to it later. So it's very difficult to say precisely that somebody has joined for that ad. And I think the other thing is going, um, I didn't point this out on the data I showed before, but uh, we have a much, much lower conversion rate on web referrals than we do say on walk-ins. We aim essentially for a 50% conversion rate. So it, from inquiry to sign up, we aim for 50% from free trial to sign up is 70 to 80%. Uh, but we have much, much lower referral rate uh, for uh, web ads, because it's much easier just to click on a web ad and apply for something than it is to actually walk in uh, into the room. Uh, textbooks for uh, Aiken were uh, Derujun Pastango, which is published by Obuncha, and Hitotsu Hitotsu, which is published by Gakken. Uh, yeah, Linda, let's keep the recording going. Uh, Linda, if you want like to leave, that's fine. I'll, I'll take care of things from here. Um, what are your services? Are your services expensive? Now, I could talk for um, uh, hours and hours on the difference between price and value. Only you can decide whether you think they're expensive or not. I think people will buy things that they think they get value from. Um, I think I would ask you in return, how much is your time worth? I'll type those textbooks into chat in a moment. How much is your time worth? You know, I, I'm extremely confident our services uh, cost a lot less than you paying yourself to do um, the work yourself. Uh, this is supposed to be a non-commercial presentation, so I shouldn't really be talking about the prices of our services, but do feel free to get in touch and ask me um, outside of this meeting or this presentation. Oops, I've sent those directly to Mike instead of sending them to the group. Here come the um, textbook names.
If people want to put their mics on, that'd be fine. Yes, Kenny, they do. Not all the time. In specific, uh, in specific, we'll run a specific campaign. We'll have a specific page for that, and so we can see how effective that campaign is. But we do, we do general brand stuff as well. You should check in on Kevin's question there at four nineteen. And uh, what was that? Any advice for waiting lists and what to do with them? Oh, I encourage the growth of a waiting list. A waiting list is a great form of marketing. Uh, if you've got a waiting list, you're successful. So again, you've got to think about what you want to do. What's your capacity? Um, how many classes can you have? How many people have you got in there? Are you teaching them all yourself or are you hiring staff? And if you get to say 80% of a workable timetable, you're happy doing that work, encourage a waiting list because if you have a waiting list, you will always replace the people that leave. And if you have a waiting list, funnily enough, everybody will want to join because you must be good, right? Nobody walks past an empty restaurant with nobody sitting in it. Everybody's curious why people are lined up outside a restaurant. Agree. When you franchise, how long do you give the new branch to fit the brand? Not sure I understand the question. Uh, when a franchise opens, it is the brand. Okay. Um, hey, uh, Simon. Yep. Hey, uh, thanks a lot for doing this presentation. Really appreciate it. It's really helpful. Um, <laughs> I have a question about uh, marketing or marketing trends. Uh, I watched uh, Masaki's um, presentation uh, before yours, and he had some charts in yeah. his uh, in his presentation about uh, English lang English language learning uh, trends from way back from 07 all the way up until last year. Yeah, and I was curious, what uh, do you know? Well, uh, what um, resources are there available that we could, as English school owners, can we look into to help us, you know, see what the marketing trends are for English schools? Because I know, for example, like as a Yano research. Yeah, I was just going to say, buy the Yano report; it'll cost you three thousand dollars. Uh huh. Yeah. But do you know of any other? It's the Research. best one. It's the it's the best one. Uh, there's always copies of it floating about. You can see, you can do searches. That people will do summary articles based on the annual report. Uh, they will pop up from time to time. Uh, magazines like Keiko to Manabu used to do. Ask your ask your advertising agency if you use one. What the trends are. I mean, obviously they're trying to sell you ads, but they should have some good information. Right. Okay. It's very very hard for a small business to grab that. Uh, that sort of information. That's and, and it's incredibly valuable information. But obviously, it's probably not worth you buying the Yano report. Again, going back to the idea that people will buy something if they think it has value and they can get more from it. And there's, you know, right. there's, there's precious little in the English language. Yano reports all in Japanese. Somebody will translate it at some point. But yeah, it's a very expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. How did I approach branding at the start? I built my brand by thinking about what I want the people to think. And that's why I chose the word modern English because since 1998, I wanted to be modern and I'm a mod. So I wanted to put a mod target on it. Uh, but that's the logo rather than the brand. Um, oh, Lelaine has sent some, is this the Yano report that Lelaine has sent? Potential security issue detected, JPEGs. I'm not gonna download that. Uh, Lelaine, if you're still here, could you let us know what those files are? Oh, sorry. I was trying to send a photo of uh, Hitotsu Hitotsu and right. the other weekend. <laughs> Thank you for that. Okay. Any other questions that people would like to ask with the mic on uh, before I close up? Yes, uh, how can I get more information like, like this? Yeah. Uh, about us and what we do or in general? In general, yeah. How can you get more information in general about running yeah. schools in Japan? Yeah, basically. Yeah. Right. Um, attend as many events as you can, I think, to do, do, do networking. You know, there's uh, 
as Jack Nitti Jane and other organizations uh, do a bit of web searching. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know of any other events that are planned at the moment. Okay, okay thanks. You, you feel free to contact me anytime you like. It's how bad I am at marketing because I haven't shown you my contact details, but um, that which I support, which I was going to do, but haven't done. And so I shall do now. Uh, if anybody would like to contact me, they can get in touch with me there. Uh, it's my email address at the bottom. And those are some of the things that we do. And that's my blog there, moreonactually.com, which I haven't been particularly active with recently. Okay, all right. Any last chance for the last question before I sign off? Nobody? I son. I yeah. have a question. Yeah, fire away. Who are you? Me. <laughs> Great. Go on, fire away. Someone asked uh, just a few minutes before, <clears throat> how can they get research that would benefit them or be meaningful for them? And you mentioned Yano. And, yeah. And I think we would both agree that most of the stuff that they'd be paying $3,000 for is beyond their their utility zone. Yep. But you know, it, it often occurred to me and back when I was <clears throat> involved in local marketing efforts for English language learning, that the most valuable piece of information was where are the customers? Mm. And um, I don't know how you guys do this, but we had our ways of doing it, but you know, times have changed. You need to know where the babies are being born. And locate and or and or advertise in areas that had babies like I don't know what depends what your target is if if Please. you're teaching seven year olds seven years ago where were the most babies born that's where you want to dump your 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 posters on or or flyers or what or mailbox inserts whatever your approach to marketing is and you can get a lot of that information from city hall often online you can find that uh, that's what I I think I think city hall. But you have to go there. They won't give it to you over the phone or anything like that. Some of them put it online now. You can hear Nagar and Hiracat. You can see online. Really? Yeah. Oh, uh, you know, the, the old classic, the old classic uh, tactic used to be just walk around, see where the elementary schools are and note the, the ratio of foreign cars to local cars. Yeah. Um, there's been, you know, there's, there, there's a, a bunch of empty elementary schools in Japan these days. It's, it's where it's like, the angels sprinkled the babies down from heaven and they kind of congregate in certain areas. If you can find those areas, that's, there's going to be more, more, more people coming up. Absolutely, yeah. And obviously with this bit of a shift, you know, uh, post COVID or, or, or in COVID with people moving out of the city. So that's going to shift again uh, a bit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a very interesting point. I, I should say, I shouldn't say this, but I have six elementary schools within a kilometer of my. There you go. Well placed. Well placed. Yeah, and that's why you moved there, right, Dave? No, I just happened to I happened to get a full time job here when I first came here at a, at a private elementary school, and then uh, yeah. it, it is location. If you're good in location, if you're the best available option in a good location, you will be successful. Definitely. Uh, you know, it, it's just location. Like you know, we've experienced this where we've we've done exactly the same product in different locations, and it's with yeah. different people, which is one factor. But uh, and. Very, very different results. Location, mm. very, it's crucial. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna wrap this up. Unless well, I'm... thank you, Simon. Great job. Great job. My pleasure. Thank Virtual you hand much. claps out there for anybody. Thank you, for thank you very much, Simon. Pleasure. I'll be in thank the very much. I'll be in the social room. Um, so if anybody wants to continue, I'll see you there. Thanks a lot for coming along. Thanks, Simon. Cheers, man. Great. Thanks.